ground forces dug into the jungles of Vietnam, the skies above saw a different kind of war. If you take every emotion you've ever felt in your life, love, hate, anger, I mean, just rage, fear, to the part where you want to uh, throw up, all of those things are going through you as you get into a dogfight. Southeast Asia is now just a distant memory. But vestiges of the battle remain. And none is more tangible than the F-4 Phantom II. Despite its age, today's wild weasel is virtually a new weapon an integral part of the machine that demolished Iraq's war-making capability in the Persian Gulf. Designed to intercept nuclear bombers, the F-4 is one of the most important fighters in military aviation history. Although the Phantom's internal systems are state-of-the-art, the plane's airframe is nearly identical to those that flew in the skies above Vietnam more than 20 years ago. Most of the aircraft are older than the men who fly them. The AIM-9 Sidewinder missile is little changed from those used in Vietnam, and pilots still say that the delay between trigger pull and missile launch is one of the longest seconds in combat aviation. Like the Phantom, the Sidewinder is adapted to modern times. And like the Phantom, it is the remnant of one of the most divisive chapters in American history. In early 1965, over 30 Americans lose their lives to Viet Cong rocket and bomb attacks in South Vietnam. There are rumors of captured U.S. advisors being tortured. For many, the car bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon is the final blow. Although it is later proven that South Vietnamese guerrillas have acted without the direction or consent of leaders in Hanoi, American wrath is quick to follow. President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who until now is reluctant to order air attacks against the North, reacts swiftly. Limited strikes are launched on targets just above the demilitarized zone that separates North from South. The first of these is called Flaming Dart. It marks the beginning of an air campaign by the White House that will continue for three years. It also marks the beginning of a micromanagement of the war that will first paralyze and then destroy the Johnson presidency. The White House often goes so far as to choose the type of ordnance to be carried on particular missions, instructions which are then relayed to pilots flying strikes over hostile territory halfway around the globe. That's the way it was. I mean, Johnson himself boasted that the U.S. Air Force can't bomb an outhouse in North Vietnam without I say so. And he meant it. They selected the targets. They would select sometimes even the path of approach. They drew circles around things that were not permitted to be attacked. You know, a 13-mile radius or something around Hanoi, four-mile radius around uh, the center of Haiphong Port, a 30-mile line below the China border. Beyond this, you dared not fly if you were an Air Force guy. It is a mere four years since the Cuban Missile Crisis pushed the superpowers to the brink of Armageddon. Johnson treads lightly, fearful that full-scale bombing of the North might widen the war. 
the president's relationship to his generals is, at best, a distant one, marked by an undercurrent of distrust. As the war drags on, this distrust turns to open antagonism. The bomber generals who ran the Air Force at the beginning of Vietnam had essentially not much knowledge of and certainly no sympathy with the whole idea of a limited war. These are men who grew up in World War II, uh, came of age as uh, military leaders, and uh, all of Europe was their target. They knew no bounds. Yankee Station, 50 miles off of the coast of North Vietnam. In these orders, U.S. carriers sail their racetrack courses in a cycle that will continue for more than eight years. By March 1965, Flaming Dart has given way to a sustained air campaign called Rolling Thunder. Yet the rules of engagement are still severe. Soviet supply ships in Haiphong Harbor and even surface-to-air missile sites are off-limits for fear of killing the Russian advisors manning them. Pilots are forbidden to attack enemy anti-aircraft sites unless fired upon first. With each passing day, northern defenses become denser and more sophisticated. There was enormous frustration amongst us as we watched supplies and military equipment being offloaded uh, in, in the port of Haiphong. Surface-to-air missile crates, ammunition that would be used against us the following day, and we couldn't touch them because of the rules. There was kind of a, a not-so-funny ha-ha floating around amongst the troops that the only people that are authorized to get killed in North Vietnam were fighter pilots from the United States. It was a very ludicrous way to fight a war. On October 26, 1967, several targets within the city of Hanoi are finally approved. Flying from the carrier Oriskany and his A-4 Skyhawk, Lieutenant John McCain sets out on the mission that would become the longest of his tour. Given two years to prepare themselves, North Vietnamese defenses are now formidable. The mission that I was shot down on was the first strike inside the city of Hanoi. At that time, Hanoi was the most heavily defended place in the history of air warfare. It had three rings of surface-to-air missiles around the city. We were striking the thermal power plant, i.e. the electrical generating plant built by the French inside of Hanoi. When I was shot down, a surface-to-air missile took the wing off my airplane. So I was in a very wildly gyrating dive, and so when I ejected, I broke my arms and my leg. My chute opened just before my feet to hit the water of the lake, thereby precluding any escape and evasion opportunities. It was a very interesting experience to land in a city that you just finished bombing, and I got a less than warm reception, or you might describe as a very warm reception. The Vietnamese came out and pulled me out and to the arms of a very agitated crowd of Vietnamese who bayoneted me a couple of times and broke my shoulder. And fortunately, the uh, Vietnamese army came along and took me to the Wallo prison, which we know of as the Hanoi Hilton. Despite bombing restrictions and the losses that these often bring about, morale among American pilots is high. As rolling thunder continues, strikes against the North are increasingly carried out by U.S. Air Force F-105 Thunder Chiefs flying from bases in Thailand. But most of the real fighting in Vietnam takes place on the ground and in the South. It is here that planes like the 105 prove how potent close air support can be. Thunder chiefs are called on time and again to rescue trapped American GIs. And in November 1965, at a place called Yadrang, ground attack aircraft save an American unit from slaughter. I 
I'm sitting here today alive and able to talk to you because close air support works. And, and in those circumstances, uh, work very well most of the time. In the Yadrang Valley, we were a battalion of 450 men surrounded by uh, 2,000 plus North Vietnamese regulars. The only thing that kept us alive was artillery and air. On the second morning of that battle, the forward air controller who was on the ground with us, wonderful guy, good time Charlie Hastings, lieutenant, phantom pilot. Boy, was he getting his feet wet as an infantryman. He radioed a code called Broken Arrow, which meant American unit in danger of being overrun. And what that signal meant was that every available aircraft in South Vietnam had to come to our rescue. And they came. Air Force, Navy, Marines, uh, they stacked them up every thousand feet from 7,000 to 35,000 feet. 82 is south of you, just about to the second river. I have 4,500 Roger, let's go get it. In the face of being overrun, the survivors at Yadrang call in airstrikes just 30 meters from their own positions. awesome. They poured it on and we talked to the North Vietnamese a couple of years ago about what it was like over there on the other side and, and one colonel said uh, we thought we were in a sea of fire. We didn't think any of us would live. The Thunder Chief is heavy and powerful. Called the Thud, or Lead Sled, by the men who fly it, the 105 will make more trips downtown, meaning missions over Hanoi, than any other aircraft of the war. Accordingly, Thud pilots are shot out of the sky in greater numbers than any of their brethren. Early in the war, men who survive 100 missions earn the right to rotate home. Often, they can thank the durability of the thud for getting them there. Well, 105 was designed primarily for low altitude, high speed, ingress, egress, and delivery, and uh, either with tactical nuclear weapons or with conventional weapons. And so it was designed to do the air to ground mission. It had good sight system. It had a good delivery system that would give you a fairly precise delivery for air to ground munitions. The Thunder Chief never possesses the agility of a dogfighter, but as a steady ground attack platform, it proves deadly. Its long legs and aerial refueling capability become crucial to men and machines hoping to make it from Thai air bases to targets over Hanoi and back again. Like most aircraft in the American arsenal, the 105 is a product of the Cold War, constructed to fly very fast and very far to deliver a nuclear payload to Russian soil. By 1966, rolling thunder is in full force. During the three years of this air campaign, nearly five times the explosives dropped in the entire Pacific theater of World War II are loosed on a nation the size of Texas. At the top of the list are the bridges leading from China to Hanoi and from Hanoi to the south. Knocking out these supply lifelines would destroy the ability of Viet Cong forces to wage their war of liberation.
images like the one at Tan Hoa become symbols of defiance for the Vietnamese people, and intricate flak traps are erected around it. U.S. flyers call it the Dragon's Jaw. Over 30 American pilots are lost attacking the bridge. Three years and hundreds of sorties matter little. Unknown to U.S. airmen, the Vietnamese have built a parallel bamboo bridge 300 yards downstream, submerged just beneath the water. From the beginning, the people of the North display a remarkable flexibility in reacting to the American air onslaught. They were very good, very quick to react. We attacked fuel depots that oiled the uh, PT boats and the North Vietnamese patrol boats, etc. Almost immediately, the North Vietnamese began disassembling their above-ground fuel depots because clearly these were not going to be safe, and they simply dispersed them. They started digging in underground tanks all over the country, and uh, that was the end of that. You know, General LeMay said, let's bomb them back to the Stone Age. Well, the problem with that is that they weren't very far out of the Stone Age when we started. But air defenses over this peasant society prove anything but primitive. From their Russian benefactors, the Vietnamese receive hundreds of state-of-the-art SA-2 surface-to-air missiles. Many of these sites are still off limits to American pilots flying overhead. It is a deadly arrangement. And by 1967, nearly 100 US aircraft have been lost to SAM attacks. Finally, after months of sitting there watching them building these SAM sites, they knock one of us down and we begin immediately. Then, let's go after them. So they do planning and they mount a raid and they send a dozen F-105s out of uh, Korat, Thailand against this thing. What happens? Six of them, half of them are shot down because they have moved the missiles, put up cardboard decoys, and built this monster flak trap. We're getting flak without the target one, watch it. Oh, eagle flag, a lot of flak out of that metal side. Here to go in at low level, one four-man group after another, down the same line of flight to the target. Maybe the first four get through okay, but uh, then the gunners all have the range, the altitude, and they just sit there and shoot you out of the sky. And the, and the pilots themselves, were, you know, drove them crazy. I found that in all of my missions, the time when, when it bothered us the most was going out to the airplane, that, that time of quiet when all of us are sitting there and you could almost smell the fear between air crews. Ground-based defenses aren't the only danger. Flying from safe havens within restricted zones, Russian-supplied MiG fighters are smaller and much more nimble than any American plane in the sky. Soviet instructors soon turn green North Vietnamese pilots into a force to be reckoned with. Americans trained to fight a nuclear war aren't prepared for the close-in dogfights that lie ahead. Our Phantom pilots were trained as interceptor pilots. There was not going to be any more dogfights. You're only going to shoot bombers from Russia coming across at point nine Mach. And we were engaged with tight turning MiGs, and we weren't doing very well. We had a one to one kill ratio. Despite their losses, American flyers in Vietnam pilot one of the greatest fighters of all time. Today's F 4 Wild Weasel is testimony to the aircraft's endurance and versatility. And its negative dihedral tail is still unique to modern combat aircraft. Underneath, a 600-gallon centerline drop tank. And in back, 
two General Electric J79 engines, each providing nearly 18,000 pounds of thrust. The Phantom's dual engines have always meant added insurance for the men in the cockpit. By war's end, Phantom pilots account for over 75 MiG kills. But this tally is hard won. The Phantom was a powerful machine. It had very good weapon systems, a good radar system, but a MiG would outturn me. The MiG-17 turned at about 19 degrees a second. A Phantom turned at about 11 degrees a second, which tells me if I get behind him and he turns at 19 degrees and I turn at 11 degrees, it doesn't take a mathematician very long to figure out he's going to come back around and shoot me if I try and stay in a horizontal fight. The upcoming showdown between MiG and Phantom marks a watershed in American military aviation. By 1968, the Navy's top gun school is founded. There, men trained to fight a nuclear war are retrained to learn traditional dogfighting techniques. We went up and fought against the F-106s uh, at McCord with the Air Force. We fought against anything that would turn that was dissimilar to the Phantom. And when I met my first MiG, I had 200 simulated combats under my belt. I had far more experience than the MiG driver had. After Top Gun was established, the Navy went to a 12 to 1 kill ratio. And if you were engaged by a MiG-21 and were at a disadvantage, the best maneuver is to get rapidly below 10,000 feet in full power, full afterburner, and then work in the vertical. We could outturn the MiG-21 under those conditions and gain an advantage. In the skies above Vietnam, pilots hurtled at one another faster than the speed of sound but their tactics often replicate those employed by aces flying over the trenches of World War I Europe half a century before. To me, dying was a pretty serious thing. I was a student of Richthofen and Emleman and Galan and Pappy Boynton and uh, Chuck Yeager and Wally Schirra, people that had set the stage for us. And I knew why they were successful, because they focused on the air, when I knew that I was going to meet another pilot in the air, that I wasn't going to walk away alive if I wasn't prepared. You look at the advantages of your airplane and the disadvantages of the enemy. What are his weapon systems? How can he bring them to bear? And while you're doing that, unfortunately, quite often, you've got a lot of other airplanes around. So what you would do is each of them is see, A, what's the capability of the pilot? If he's not flying his airplane very well, I'll go right for his throat and kill him quick. If he is flying a very good airplane, then I will fight him a little more defensively, make him make a mistake, and then I will go for his throat. With Top Gun and the F-4, American air superiority in Vietnam is never again in question. The difference that we face is that we only saw MiGs three times, and at one time there was a massive MiGs up. On May 10, 1972, Randall Cunningham becomes the war's first ace after splashing three MiGs in one day. This is the cockpit audio from that mission. This is Red Crown on guard. Bandits, bandits, bullseye, zero, three. If you take every emotion you've ever felt in your life, love, hate, anger, I mean just rage, fear, to the part where you want to uh, throw up. All of those things are going through you as you get into a dogfight. The feeling of watching the other guy go down in flames instead of you, it's like being reborn. Now, in the case when you go through that and you take a deep breath and all of a sudden you're engaged by 22 other MiGs, if you allow 
allow yourself the luxury of fear. If you allow those motions to take over and control you, you're vulnerable at the same time. The first MiG, I was pretty much in control. The second MiG, when he came in behind me, I saw tracers coming by, and I remember I almost froze. I went, like, what am I going to do? And, and I remember the fear that started to take over. More anger than fear that other rotten fellow did umbrage to one of your friends, and so you don't really fear the bastard, you want to go kill him. I guess that's that's the warrior nature of fighter pilots. Only five in Vietnam reached the vaulted status of ace. You guys have a party last night? Did we ever? <laughs> I remember coming back to the carrier and one of the pilots said, Duke, how did it feel to kill somebody? And it hadn't struck me until that moment. And I remember, again, the impact. I think if you ever get used to taking another human life, uh, you shouldn't be there. But life is readily taken in Vietnam and neither side is immune. Before wars end, more than 800 U.S. airmen are killed in the skies above Southeast Asia. As with body counts in the ground war, Policymakers turned the skies above Vietnam into a macabre battle of statistics. For air commanders, the sortie, not the body count, becomes the means of proving to the White House that victory is near. The problem was not just with the President of the United States. It rested with the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the military commanders all the way down to unit commanders. They would launch airplanes with less than a full bomb load against targets that were relatively meaningless in order to say that they had flown so many, quote, sorties that day. I'll never forget my first mission. Uh, I received a readout on it. It was called the Vin Military Barracks, which sounds good. And then when I examined the history of the target, I found that it had only been bombed 12 times before. So I went over and dropped my bombs on a pile of concrete that had been bombed uh, 12 times previously. This, this whole thing became somewhat of a charade. Throughout the war, the most elusive targets are those along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Interdicting the supplies that run down it from the north is constantly at the forefront of the American air effort. First of all, you have to understand it wasn't one trail. I mean, there wasn't this six-lane superhighway out there in the jungle. There, this was a network, and it was literally hundreds of trails. And if you cut one, they went around and, uh, and started a new one. We had not much success at shutting that down. We made it costly. We made them pay a terrible price in lives and blown up equipment. But they were willing to pay that price. Acoustic and seismic detectors are dropped to pick up movement beneath the dense layers of jungle canopy. But this advanced technology is often rendered ineffective by the land's torturous climate and terrain. By 1968, 75 tons of supplies moved south every day. What I laughingly called uh, the, the secret weapon of the, of the Vietnam War was this bicycle, 
with a, with a bamboo pole tied to the left handlebar and the frame supporting two poles that stuck up. And to these poles, uh, they tied four or 500 pounds of stuff. And this is what they moved their war supply with down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, here we are with uh, Mach one and a half uh, fighter planes uh, trying to blow up a guy pushing a bicycle. Uh, this is not effective use of air action. And, and it didn't work very well. One of the primary weapons in hitting the trail was the B-52. Like the Phantom, it still flies today. Any rings, watches, make sure you guys have your protection on, have nice, safe load. Ten up, great. Built as a long-range lone wolf nuclear penetrator, the 52 was another product of the Cold War that had to adapt to the conventional task of fighting in Vietnam. But formation bombing and delivering conventional stores was a mission to which it readily adapted. One of the most lethal loads is the cluster bomb. It's a baseball-type bomblet with embedded ball bearings. When these were dropped out of uh, canisters from the B-52 bomb bay, uh, the canisters opened up and these fell free and individually. And the falling through the air, these veins caused the bomblet to spin. And once this bomb spins up to about 2,000 revolutions per minute, then these little arming clips will fly off. And then on first contact, the bomb would explode. This will make sieves out of anything it hits. I'm told that these little ball bearings and this thing explodes can penetrate a quarter inch steel plate to 50 yards away. Break right, ready, ready, now. These were very successfully used against the fuel storage locations or trucks amassed for convoy work and, and personnel concentrations. Okay. Flying at altitudes in excess of 30,000 feet, those below cannot hear the planes overhead. Often, they hit the same stretch of the trail twice in one day in hopes of catching laborers out in the open. Standby to release. Ready, ready, now. Door is open. Roger, standing by release. PDI, sir. Roger, standing by to release. Ready, ready, now. Bombs away. From a kilometer away, the sonic roar of a 52 drop tears eardrums and knocks victims senseless. From a half kilometer, bunkers collapse, burying alive those cowering inside. One Viet Cong survivor recalled, it seemed as I'd been caught in the apocalypse. The terror was complete. One lost control of bodily functions as the mind screamed incomprehensible orders to get out. When the B-52s found their mark, it was not just that things were destroyed. In some awful way, they ceased to exist. By January 1968, one of the war's most compelling dramas is about to play itself out. At a distant airstrip in the central highlands near the hamlet of Quezon, 6,000 Marines find themselves surrounded by upwards of 30,000 NVA regulars. For the first time in the war, the enemy amasses division-sized units for a set-piece battle. Here, more than anywhere, the Strato Fortress plays a pivotal role. At 
Quezon, reinforcement and resupply by air is the only alternative. The Marines dig in for the coming battle. Enemy shells hit the base at the rate of one every minute for five weeks. In desperation, B-52 strikes are called in around the clock to keep the enemy at bay. For nearly three months, the bombers fly in from Guam and Thailand. The normal target boundary from friendly forces is two miles, but the Vietnamese know this and move inside the circle. As the NVA threat grows, strikes are called in just 200 yards from the Marine trenches. Bomber cells arrive over Quezon every three hours for nearly six weeks. They unleash over 75,000 tons of bombs on the enemy below. These are things that are never forgotten. A friend of mine, a Vietnamese photographer, was drafted into the South Vietnamese Army, and his battalion was wiped out in a misplaced B-52 strike. He survived, but his hair turned white. I mean, he was 19 years old, and, and he went absolutely white-headed. The destructive power of a B-52 strike truly has to be seen to be believed. The savior of the Marines at Quezon is not the Stratofortress alone. C-123 and C-130 transport pilots brave one of the most dangerous landings in history to bring in fresh men and supplies and take out the wounded. Most of our operations, we'd fly in at high altitude, which for us was about uh, three to 5,000 feet. And then we'd throw out full flaps and drop the gear and just dive at the runway and flare just before contact so that they didn't have time to decide whether they wanted to shoot us or not. For many trash haulers, NVA gunners aren't the only threat. I think I took more gunfire from the United States Marines than I did from any of the North Vietnamese regulars. Uh, usually we'd start real early in the morning as we flew over the Marine fire bases and we woke them up and they didn't like that so they'd take a few shots at us. Twelve weeks after it began, the siege at Quezon is lifted. Two months later, the base is abandoned. 1968 also marks the end of rolling thunder. President Johnson imposes a bombing halt over the North that will last four years. But we will not surrender. And we will not retreat. But in the South, it is business as usual. Many regions have been declared free fire zones. By war's end, nearly 75% of the ordnance dropped will fall not in North, but in South Vietnam. Nothing epitomizes the brutal efficiency of American air power better than the AC-47 and AC-130 gunship. The plane's 20 millimeter cannon fired a rate of over 5,000 rounds per minute. Turning slowly on one wing, these aircraft can level any target. We got a call from the ground controllers telling us to leave the area because there was heavy artillery coming in. And of course, the, the low-flying aircraft were supposed to leave that area because the arc of the artillery, we didn't want the aircraft to get struck. And uh, we were trying to tell him that there's no heavy artillery coming in. We were the heavy artillery. And of course, he's thinking, well, these 105 howitzer shells aren't coming from an airplane. And 
we went back and forth a few minutes and then told him, he says, look, there's a house about two clicks south of you with a red roof. Do you see it? He says, yeah, got it. So keep an eye on it. And we gave him a two-shot drill, which is 205 howitzer shells within three seconds. It's a good drill. And uh, we fired him off, and the pilot says, you, you see that house? And he keyed his mic, said, yeah. And about that time, it just disintegrated. And all he could say was, damn, stick around. We got some targets for you. In spite of official statements otherwise, CIA documents from the time warn the White House that over 1,500 innocent Vietnamese civilians are dying every week from Allied bombing. Any time that you move down onto the coastal plains where you have a high-density rural population, I mean, every fence row's got another hooch in it, Anything you shoot, even a rifle bullet, is going to hit something that it probably wasn't intended to hit. And certainly if you're firing artillery, and even more so if you're dropping bombs and firing cannon and shooting napalm, you do fierce damage to the people who live there. You've got a farmer, and he's paying taxes to both sides, and he's doing his best to get by. And you come along and, and, and your helicopter uh, strafes his area and kills his water buffalo, boy, that makes him angry. You've just, you've just hurt his rice bowl. You've broken his rice bowl. How's he going to farm without his tractor, which is his water buffalo? You come along with the Air Force and you drop a bomb down his smokestack and you kill his wife and kids, you've just made a Viet Cong. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Tonight I have ordered our aircraft and our naval vessels to make no attacks on North Vietnam. In the face of growing criticism, the president halts the bombing campaign of the North, but his public support evaporates anyway. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. In truth, the Johnson administration never grasps the intensity of Vietnamese nationalism or the depth of enemy resolve. The bombing halt gives northern leaders four precious years to strengthen their air defenses. Vietnamese optimism never runs higher. As the spring of 1972 approaches, nearly 20,000 more Americans have died in Vietnam since Nixon took office on a platform promising to get out of the war. Morale is at a low point. As the U.S. scales down its commitment, negotiations drag on in Paris. By winter, the White House has run out of patience. President Richard Nixon is consumed with a showdown mentality. In a memo to Kissinger, he writes, I cannot emphasize too strongly that I have determined that we should go for broke. I intend to stop at nothing to bring the enemy to his knees. He has gone over the brink, and so have we. We have the ability to destroy his war-making capacity. The only question is whether we have the will to use that power. What distinguishes me from Johnson is that I have the will in spades. American aircraft are again flying over the north. Advances in smart bomb technology enable them to do the impossible. Using 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs, a pair of phantoms strike the bridge at Tan Hoa. In just seconds, the dragon's jaw is no more. Across the region, over 200 B-52s are assembled. In Guam alone, they take up over five miles of ramp space. For the first time, the major rules of engagement are lifted and American bombers will be used strategically. Crews arrive at their evening briefing unaware of the change in U.S. policy. When we went in to brief, we had more staff members there, uh, the chaplains were there. I mean, I'd flown already about two, three months, 
and I hadn't seen a chaplain. Now we're praying before our mission. That was weird. Then they bust us all off to the dining facility for steak and eggs, and this was like 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd never done that before either. So this, there's something strange going on here. It was good to finally go to the heart of the enemy, where his thinking and planning was, was going on. It was good to know that we were going to finally hit targets that could hurt him instead of trying to chase him up and down the trails of Vietnam. We knew we had targets. We were taking down his power grid. We were taking down his airport. We were taking down his rail system. Those are the kind of targets that a B-52 was designed to hit. than a week, U.S. forces drop over 100,000 bombs. For their part, Vietnamese gunners fire off over 1,000 missiles, knocking nearly 30 American airplanes out of the sky. The way you can tell the SAM is coming towards your aircraft, basically, is you'll see him when he launches from the ground because you'll see a large puff of flame and it'll continue. And if it's moving horizontally in relation to you, you're safe because then it's not coming towards you. If it continues to maintain that same pinpoint at you without moving horizontally, then he's coming towards your aircraft. On the way out over a little town called Nam Den, I was hit with a surface-to-air missile. I remember thinking that uh, I didn't want to be a prisoner of war because the airplane actually went upside down. And I remember thinking that, well, the only time I'd ever asked for any divine guidance is when I'd been in trouble. And I remember thinking, God, I don't want to be a prisoner of war because I was over the Red River Valley. It's like flying over downtown Los Angeles. I knew if I ejected, I'd be a prisoner. I remember taking the, the stick and putting it to the left-hand side, and the airplane righted itself. And I remember thinking, God didn't have anything to do with this. It was my just superior flying skills. But about that time, the airplane went back upside down, and I can remember thinking, God, I didn't mean it. Get me out of here. When I ejected, I came down in the mouth of the Red River. They sent PT boats out after us. Our guy stayed and almost ran out of fuel, keeping the VC off of my back seater and I before the Marine helicopter could come in and pick us up. So it's a team effort. After all those dogfights, after bombing the target, after coming down in a parachute, having the VC trying to get to me where the helicopters came in, when I got back on the carrier, I remember I wept like a baby. I got on my knees and, and said, God, thank you. For the men of the Hanoi Hilton, the Christmas bombings of 1972 bring renewed hope. One night, air raid sirens went off and began perhaps the most spectacular and to us, encouraging display of military power that we'd ever observed. And that was wave after wave of B-52s flying at night, somewhere around 30, 35,000 feet. And they were dropping enormous amounts of bombs on designated military targets. Even though they were far away, the room would shake. Sometimes even the air would uh, would be sucked out of the room slightly. When a B-52 was hit, it would light up the entire sky in a pink uh, glow, it would mark its progress from over 30,000 feet to the ground. The North Vietnamese are never really caught off guard by U.S. strikes. Soviet intelligence trawlers drift in the waters off of Guam and shadow U.S. carriers. They supplement a sophisticated early warning radar net and throughout the war relay flight data on impending raids to Hanoi. We'd 
usually be out on the balcony of the BOQs uh, at Anderson. That's where I was flying from. And we'd count the airplanes as they took off, and then we knew when they'd be about back, and we'd go out and count them coming back. And sure enough, there'd be fewer. We'd read every day about the, the bombers that didn't come back. Yeah, we knew there was, it was happening. And we were concerned about it because every airplane was flying the same track, in and out. Vietnamese gunners sight in on well-worn American bombing paths. In the first four days, 11 stratofortresses go down in flames. When some crews refuse to fly, tactics are changed. And after eight years of restraint, the bomber generals finally have their way. I tried not to think about what we were doing to those people personally, but I tried to think about those friends that I'd lost and uh, the friends that I lost daily uh, because we had people get killed daily. Airplanes uh, not come back and uh, when you get back and you see uh, someone come in to clear out a locker, uh, it kind of gave us a little bit of a, a feeling of to hell with them. Let's do what we've got to do and get this over with. With the bulk of their air defenses destroyed, the Vietnamese returned to the bargaining table with quickened resolve to end the war. And on January 23, 1973, less than a month after the last bomb is dropped, hostilities end. Although the air war over Hanoi forces this diplomatic breakthrough, peace with honor is anything but victory. In little more than two years' time, Saigon would be firmly in North Vietnamese hands. There were many military leaders that knew that the air war in Vietnam could not succeed. And there were many leaders that knew that our strategy in South Vietnam could not succeed. And very, very few of them ever spoke up. An air campaign that poured so many millions of tons of high explosive on that place in the end didn't make that much difference. You can't get that bicycle. You can't stop that sort of a supply line. It will get through, especially of people as determined as our enemy were there. For men like John McCain, the war is nearly over. There was a kind of a, a moment when the pilot of the airplane came over the loudspeaker when we were leaving Vietnam that we had uh, left Vietnamese soil and were over the water that probably was a, a demarcation point, uh, both mentally and physically. Everybody cheered, <laughs> hollered and shouted and cheered. On February 12, 1973, the first released American pilots landed Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. After seven years, six months, and 24 days in captivity, Navy Commander Jeremiah Ditton steps forward to speak for McCain and the rest. The whole country welcomes you. We're so glad to have you back and so thankful for what you and all of you have done for us. We are honored to have had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances. We are profoundly grateful to our Commander-in-Chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. We could have nuked the place. We could have turned all of North Vietnam into a glass-floored, self-lighting parking lot. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson gave a speech at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore where he basically offered $2 billion in aid to the North Vietnamese if they would stop their aggression in South Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson was forever puzzled as to why he didn't hear from Ho Chi Minh. Even if we had invaded North Vietnam and, and taken the place, my son, 
today would probably be in an army that was garrisoning South and North Vietnam. around it. U.S. flyers call it the Dragon's Jaw. Over 30 American pilots are lost attacking the bridge. Three years and hundreds of sorties matter little. Unknown to U.S. airmen, the Vietnamese have built a parallel bamboo bridge 300 yards downstream, submerged just beneath the water. From the beginning, the people of the North display a remarkable flexibility in reacting to the American air onslaught. They were very good, very quick to react. We attacked fuel depots that oiled the uh, PT boats and the North Vietnamese patrol boats, etc. Almost immediately, the North Vietnamese began disassembling their above ground fuel depots because clearly these were not going to be safe and they simply dispersed them. They started digging in underground tanks all over the country and uh, that was the end of that. You know, General LeMay said, let's bomb them back to the Stone Age. Well, the problem with that is that they weren't very far out of the Stone Age when we started. But air defenses over this peasant society prove anything but primitive. From their Russian benefactors, the Vietnamese receive hundreds of state-of-the-art SA-2 surface-to-air missiles. Many of these sites are still off limits to American pilots flying overhead. It is a deadly arrangement. And by 1967, nearly 100 U.S. aircraft have been lost to SAM attacks. Finally, after months of sitting there watching them building these SAM sites, they knock one of us down and we begin immediately. Then, let's go after them. So they do planning and they mount a raid. And they send a dozen F-105s out of uh, Korat, Thailand against this thing. What happens? Six of them, half of them are shot down. Because they have moved the missiles put up cardboard decoys and built this monster flak trap. We're getting flat without target one, watch it. Eagle flight, a lot of flak out of that metal sight. You're to go in at low level, one four-man group after another, down the same line of flight to the target. Maybe the first four get through okay, but uh, then the gunners all have the range, the altitude, and they just sit there and shoot you out of the sky. And the, and the pilots themselves, were, you know, drove them crazy. I found that in all of my missions, the time when, when it bothered us the most was going out to the airplane that that time of quiet when all of us are sitting there and you could almost smell the fear between air crews. Ground-based defenses aren't the only danger. Flying from safe havens within restricted zones, Russian-supplied MiG fighters are smaller and much more nimble than any American plane in the sky. Soviet instructors soon turn green North Vietnamese pilots into a force to be reckoned with. Given two years to prepare themselves, North Vietnamese defenses are now formidable. The mission that I was shot down on was the first strike inside the city of Hanoi. At that time, Hanoi was the most heavily defended place in the history of air warfare. It had three rings of surface-to-air missiles around the city. We were striking the thermal power plant, i.e. the electrical generating plant built by the French inside of Hanoi. When I was
was shot down, surf air missile took the wing off my airplane. So I was in a very wildly gyrating dive. And so when I ejected, I broke my arms and my leg. My chute opened just before my feet to hit the water of the lake, thereby precluding any escape and evasion opportunities. It was a very interesting experience to land in a city that you just finished bombing. And I got a less than warm reception, or you might describe as a very warm reception. The Vietnamese came out and pulled me out and to the arms of a very agitated crowd of Vietnamese who bayoneted me a couple of times and broke my shoulder. And fortunately, the uh, Vietnamese army came along and took me to the Wallow prison, which we know of as the Hanoi Hilton. Despite bombing restrictions and the losses that these often bring about, morale among American pilots is high. As rolling thunder continues, strikes against the North are increasingly carried out by U.S. Air Force F-105 Thunder Chiefs flying from bases in Thailand. But most of the real fighting in Vietnam takes place on the ground and in the South. It is here that planes like the 105 prove how potent close air support can be. Thunder chiefs are called on time and again to rescue trapped American GIs. And in November 1965, at a place called Yadrang, ground attack aircraft save an American unit from slaughter. I'm sitting here today alive and able to talk to you because close air support works. And, and in those circumstances, uh, work very well most of the time. In the Yadrang Valley, we were a battalion of 450 men surrounded by uh, 2,000 plus North Vietnamese regulars. The only thing that kept us alive was artillery and air. On the second morning of that battle, the forward air controller who was on the ground with us, a wonderful guy, Good time Charlie Hastings, lieutenant, phantom pilot. Boy, was he getting his feet wet as an infantryman. He radioed a code called Broken Arrow, which meant American unit in danger of being overrun. And what that signal meant was that every available aircraft in South Vietnam had to come to our rescue. And they came. forces dug into the jungles of Vietnam, the skies above saw a different kind of war. If you take every emotion you've ever felt in your life, love, hate, anger, I mean, just rage, fear, to the part where you want to uh, throw up, all of those things are going through you as you get into a dogfight. Southeast Asia is now just a distant memory. But vestiges of the battle remain. And none is more tangible than the F-4 Phantom II. Despite its age, today's wild weasel is virtually a new weapon an integral part of the machine that demolished Iraq's war-making capability in the Persian Gulf. To 
designed to intercept nuclear bombers, the F-4 is one of the most important fighters in military aviation history. Although the Phantom's internal systems are state-of-the-art, the plane's airframe is nearly identical to those that flew in the skies above Vietnam more than 20 years ago. Most of the aircraft are older than the men who fly them. The AIM-9 Sidewinder missile is little changed from those used in Vietnam, and pilots still say that the delay between trigger pull and missile launch is one of the longest seconds in combat aviation. Like the Phantom, the Sidewinder is adapted to modern times. And like the Phantom, it is the remnant of one of the most divisive chapters in American history. In early 1965, over 30 Americans lose their lives to Viet Cong rocket and bomb attacks in South Vietnam. There are rumors of captured U.S. advisors being tortured. For many, the car bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon is the final blow. Although it is later proven that South Vietnamese guerrillas have acted without the direction or consent of leaders in Hanoi, American wrath is quick to follow. President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who until now is reluctant to order air attacks against the North, reacts swiftly. Limited strikes are launched on targets just above the demilitarized zone that separates North from South. The first of these is called Flaming Dart. Air Force, Navy, Marines, uh, they stacked them up every thousand feet from 7,000 to 35,000 feet. In the face of being overrun, the survivors at Yadrang call in airstrikes just 30 meters from their own positions. And it was awesome. They poured it on, and we talked to the North Vietnamese a couple of years ago about what it was like over there on the other side, and, and one colonel said, uh, we thought we were in a sea of fire. We didn't think any of us would live. The Thunder Chief is heavy and powerful. Called the Thud, or Lead Sled, by the men who fly it, the 105 will make more trips downtown, meaning missions over Hanoi, than any other aircraft of the war. Accordingly, Thud pilots are shot out of the sky in greater numbers than any of their brethren. Early in the war, men who survive 100 missions earn the right to rotate home. Often, they can thank the durability of the thud for getting them there. Well, 105 was designed primarily for low altitude, high speed, ingress, egress, and delivery, and uh, either with tactical nuclear weapons or with conventional weapons. And so it was designed to do the air to ground mission. It had good sight system. It had a good delivery system that would give you a fairly precise delivery for air to ground munitions. The Thunder Chief never possesses the agility of a dogfighter, but as a steady ground attack platform, it proves deadly. Its long legs and aerial refueling capability become crucial to men and machines hoping to make it from Thai air bases to targets over Hanoi and back again. Like most aircraft in the American arsenal, the 105 is a product of the Cold War. 
constructed to fly very fast and very far to deliver a nuclear payload to Russian soil. By 1966, rolling thunder is in full force. During the three years of this air campaign, nearly five times the explosives dropped in the entire Pacific theater of World War II are loosed on a nation the size of Texas. At the top of the list are the bridges leading from China to Hanoi and from Hanoi to the south. Knocking out these supply lifelines would destroy the ability of Viet Cong forces to wage their war of liberation. Bridges like the one at Tan Hoa become symbols of defiance for the Vietnamese people, and intricate flak traps are erected. It marks the beginning of an air campaign by the White House that will continue for three years. It also marks the beginning of a micromanagement of the war that will first paralyze and then destroy the Johnson presidency. The White House often goes so far as to choose the type of ordnance to be carried on particular missions. Instructions which are then relayed to pilots flying strikes over hostile territory halfway around the globe. That's the way it was. I mean, Johnson himself boasted that the U.S. Air Force can't bomb an outhouse in North Vietnam without I say so. And he meant it. They selected the targets. They would select sometimes even the path of approach. They drew circles around things that were not permitted to be attacked. You know, a 13-mile radius or something around Hanoi, four-mile radius around uh, the center of Haiphong Port, a 30-mile line below the China border. Beyond this, you dared not fly if you were an Air Force guy. It is a mere four years since the Cuban Missile Crisis pushed the superpowers to the brink of Armageddon. Johnson treads lightly, fearful that full-scale bombing of the North might widen the war. The president's relationship to his generals is, at best, a distant one, marked by an undercurrent of distrust. As the war drags on, this distrust turns to open antagonism. The bomber generals who ran the Air Force at the beginning of Vietnam had essentially not much knowledge of and certainly no sympathy with the whole idea of a limited war. These are men who grew up in World War II, uh, came of age as uh, military leaders, and uh, all of Europe was their target. They knew no bounds. Yankee Station, 50 miles off of the coast of North Vietnam. In these orders, U.S. carriers sail their racetrack courses in a cycle that will continue for more than eight years. By March 1965, Flaming Dart has given way to a sustained air campaign called Rolling Thunder. Yet the rules of engagement are still severe. Soviet supply ships in Haiphong Harbor and even surface-to-air missile sites are off-limits for fear of killing the Russian advisors manning them. Pilots are forbidden to attack enemy anti-aircraft sites unless fired upon first. With each passing day, northern defenses become denser and more sophisticated. There was enormous frustration amongst us as we watched supplies and military equipment being offloaded uh, in, in the port of Haiphong. Surface-to-air missile crates, ammunition that would be used against us the following day, and we couldn't touch them because of the rules. There was kind of a, a not-so-funny ha-ha floating around amongst the troops that the only people that were authorized to get killed in North Vietnam were fighter pilots from the United States. It was a very ludicrous way to fight a war. On October 26, 1967, several targets within the city of Hanoi are finally approved. Flying from the carrier Oriskany and his A-4 Skyhawk, Lieutenant John McCain sets out on the mission that would become the longest of his tour. <laughs> 